I want my kids to look back at that Christmas morning and remembering how, how they woke up and the excitement and all the different things that went into every deta- detail from the meal to the decor, the gifts and everything. And, and I thought about it, to be honest, that's, it's not just Christmas that I want that, it's, it's my life that we want that. I, I want it to be, you know how you envision Christmas of the kids running downstairs and they're excited and everything that you gave them is exactly what they want and they're ecstatic to give and they're thankful and and I, I wish my whole life was like that. We, I wish I could orchestrate my life to be like that. I mean, some of you right now, you're, you're thinking, I wish my life was the way that I could plan it to be. To where my finances were everything that I wished it would be. Because I'm, I'm thinking with my kids, I, if, if I was to tell you not just Christmas what I want, if I could tell you my life's desire for my kids to grow up in church and love God and marry people that love God and and, and, and get their, their degree and, and, and live on to serve God and not just his children and all that. And if I could orchestrate it that way, I'd be a very happy person. I said, but man, if I was really to look at Christmas, if I was really to lay it out, Pastor Tony, I'll, I'll tell you what you would find at most of us. You're going to find this Christmas, you're going to find somebody that wasn't there that was last year because there was family, family drama that said that they're not coming back anymore got an empty chair in the house that a loved one was taken home to be with the Lord this past year. To be honest, there is going to be broken parents that worry all night about their child that has either gone away from the Lord, is no longer serving God, or gotten some sort of problem and said, Mom and Dad, I'm not coming home. There's sickness, there's cancer, there is problems, there's Wives that I, I, I know that are just distraught because they put everything into this and they don't even know their husband put the effort into buying them anything. And it's just evidence of the love that he has for her. In a world that we strive for perfection, it is actually filled with brokenness. I mean, I mean you just think about it. I mean, I'll be honest, we have done the same thing with this mindset of what we picture it to be or what we want it to be and the reality of what it truly is. We've done that with Christmas. And I, I started thinking about that as for the way that we portray it. And not that it's bad. It's not that it's bad, but the way that we portray Christmas and our nat- nativity sets and a lot of things. And I, I'm reading through the Bible and I'm reading through the story and I'm going, whoa, it didn't happen that way. I mean, we're going to get real for a minute. I mean, we're just going to lay it out of how it is. I think of the song, Silent Night. Silent night, holy night. All is calm. All is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy and tender. And we sing those words, and I started thinking about all is calm. Can I just for a minute take you back to that night? Can, Can we just, in our minds... Think about the fact that this virgin young girl gave birth to her firstborn child in a stable. All is calm. Can can I remind you that the only help she had of delivering her firstborn child was a carpenter? I, I don't know how much education he had about delivering children, but I'm sure that didn't give her a lot of confidence in what she was doing. The story of Christmas is not that of perfection at all. I, I, I don't think all was calm, all was bright, the way that we want to think that it was. The same way that we have this picture-perfect Christmas in life in our mind, and we want to do that same thing with, with Christmas story, but it wasn't that way. You, you, I, I want to take you back and just show you all the things that happened from the family drama to, to being engaged, to find out that your wife is with child and not knowing. And of course, we look back and say, well, of course, it was the... Ch- the holy child of God, what was there to be afraid of? Let me tell you, they didn't know that then. And a lot of us would look at life differently it, it, when once we're two years out of the problem, looking back and going, of course, no, that's no big deal. God brought us through. God, there was a reason for that. But when you're on this side of it, you walk into it, you're thinking, man, my life is falling apart. And this is horrible. And, I, and I, God, why would you do this to me? Imagine being Joseph. And having your wife come up to you and say, hey, I'm with child, and then turn around and says, but it's okay, I'm still a virgin, and the child is from God, and and you being perplexed in your mind, saying, how can this be? And it being an angel of God had to straighten this out. Divine intervention coming down to tell them what was going on. Joseph ready to put his wife to be away in this situation. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Let me show you. I want, I want to walk you through this. Not, not this perfect imagery that we'd like to think of. And I want you to see why. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Jump down to verse 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. All right, all right, we got, it was about 80, mile, 80 miles that they had to go. Depending on the, the direction and things that they took, 80 miles, that's about four days of walking. And they said with her being with child, it could have been even longer than that. And okay, that, that's not the best situation. And I'm already in this predicament where everybody in the city is looking at us funny. And it's not what I would expect it to be. But go on. And, and it says being great with child. L- let me ask you guys a, a, a simple question. Let me ask you guys, men here today. How many of you ever traveled with a pregnant wife before? All right. I have traveled a, a, a few times as a youth pastor. We went on these trips with the pregnant. I, I forgot you were in here. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> I, I don't know if Mary had morning sickness or afternoon sickness or heartburn or my back hurts or all that. But you throw 80 miles Having to go, and you can't, honey, I hate to tell you this, but Caesar, we, we've got to go on this trip. I'm, I'm, honey, have you not seen me? I know, babe, but this is just horrible timing. I know, but we have to go. I am not just child. I, I'm just not pregnant, honey. I am great with child. I don't know if that was her phrasing, but I, honey, I am great with child. And on top of that, we're not talking leather seats. Well, actually, we are, aren't we? Never mind, that's a bad illustration. <laughs> We're not talking heated seats. No recliner. You can say these two were spiritual people. I'd imagine after a while, I was like, Lord, come on, please, just help us to get there. No. So they arrived at the city. You can imagine going from place to place trying to find and saying, Honey, oh, I just want to sit down. That's all I want. I just want a bed. Honey, I, 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 I cannot. My back hurts. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm frustrated. I have heartburn. Honey, all I'm asking is just find me a bed. It doesn't even have to be a nice bed. It doesn't. Honey, I promise. You know, I don't know about you guys. We say that there was no place in the inn. I guarantee it was not just one place and say, hey, do you have a I'm sorry, honey. Let's go sleep in a barn. You're talking persistence at the first place. I, I promise there's got to be something, something, something. How many doors did they knock on for him to turn around and say, Honey, I hate to tell you this, but no, nothing. Me, me and the guys one time, when we were younger, we went to visit some friends in Georgia. Did not make hotel reservations. We thought we stayed out late. We went to this church thing that they had, this whole late thing. And then we decided we were just going to go find a hotel. No hotel. No hotel. No uh, hotel. Uh, Everything was booked to tournaments in town. 3 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, we finally found a place, and they said, we have no rooms. I said, well, we have one, but it hasn't even been cleaned yet. We begged the guy to give us that unclean room to stay there that night, and he did. He, he let us in just because of the situation and everything. When you get desperate, when you're exhausted, I'm telling you, your mood changes. Right. Say, wait up, Pastor Tony, this is Mary. Mary, we draw her out of having a halo, but if we were to interview Joseph today, and he said, dude, there was no halo, let me tell you right now, 80 miles on a donkey, no halo. If I was to tell you, you're going to have this, the child of God conceived with the Holy Spirit, wouldn't you have the expectation that everything was going to be perfect? God with me, I, I am, I, they're going to they're gonna welcome me with, you know, praise. I, I, I mean, we're going to stay in the nicest place. I, I am carrying the Son of God. I, I'm trying to lead up to something that will let you know that even with God in your life, things don't lead up to your expectations. Life is filled with brokenness. It gets better. It really does. Turn to Matthew. I know, I know we're in Luke, but to, to get the story, because the, the story is actually split up. Not all of Luke tells a part of Matthew. Matthew doesn't tell all the part of Luke. But that's the beauty of having the Gospels like this. Matthew verse two, verse 13, chapter 2, verse 13. 
And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream. Now this is later on down the story. Arise and take the young child, around two years old, and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For here's the, the bonus information. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now once again, he gets told by God to do this. Can you imagine make, waking Mary up for that one? Honey, uh, there's some people that want to, to kill our son. We need to go now. Honey, I, 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 there's always going to be accusations. No, honey, this is the king. This is the king. He is sending out soldiers to kill our child. Let me tell you, when life is filled with disappointment, never ask the question, can it get any worse? Have you ever done that before? Honey, I, what, what else could happen? Everything's falling apart. Nothing is working out. But I don't understand. We have the child of God. We have Jesus with us. Why is there so much? Can you imagine running from that? Can you imagine being Mary holding Jesus, that little boy, in her, and, and looking over her shoulder and jumping at every sound that she heard? I said, well, why would she do that? Because she was entrusted to raise Child of God. Verse 14, then he arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed in, in, in into Egypt. And verse 16, not, you just say, this is a real world. This is Jesus. This is, you talk about, I, I wish I had more of Jesus in my family. Could you get any more of Jesus in your family? And Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and the coast thereof from two years old and under. Can you imagine the screams of that city? Can you imagine if it was in today's technology of Facebook and Twitter and the news and everything lighting up in the front of this massacre happens, two-year-old uh, children and under dying everywhere and all this thing, you say, why in the world would so much tragedy happen? Because here's the thing, we live in a broken world. I'm going to give you two points this morning. And I want to pull this out of here and show you. We're, we're, the, the subject that we're talking about is the heart of Christ. The heart of Christmas. Of why he came and his desire. Because a lot of us would think this doesn't make sense. Why was he born in the middle of this? Let me show you. Number one, he was born into our brokenness. I, I want you guys to see this. He wasn't, we, we say he came to save us from our brokenness. I, I'm here to tell you, he was born into your brokenness. Smack in the middle of the mess. There you find Jesus. Look again at Matthew. Go back to chapter 1 verse 23. Behold a virgin shall be with child. And shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Being interpreted as God with us. This is the real story. This is, this is what's happening right now. They, they have God with them in the middle of that. And I, I bring that out for you to understand. Just because you have God in your life doesn't mean that there's not going to be these problems. And a lot of us feel off to the side and you're thinking, man, I've, I, I'm embarrassed of my life. And I'm embarrassed looking back. My life is a mess. It's filled with disappointment and aggravation and problems and everything else. I must be doing something wrong. Maybe it's not that you're doing something wrong. You just have to remember that you live in a broken world. It's not that God's picking on you. Some people have lost their praise when we're even singing about the risen Savior and the different things like that because you are a little bitter towards God in your heart because you feel like he's picking on you. I have God in my life. I serve. I tithe. I give. I do all these different things. And look at the mess that I have. Couldn't Mary and Joseph have said the same thing? See, see the thing was God had a plan to be born into their brokenness. He, let, let me point out some things with this. He is God with us. When the unexpected is thrown into our lives. Do you get that? He is still God with us. When the unexpected. You, you think about this story. About how she did not plan to be conceived with this child. He did not plan to be a spouse to a woman that was now pregnant, they did not plan to have this calling to go to be taxed and have the travel. None of this. It was totally thrown their way. Do you understand that God is still God when you go through the unexpected? 
And I promise you, some of you are there right now. And it's not that God's mad at you. It's not that God doesn't love you. It's not that God doesn't care about you. It's just the fact that that is life. And I'll tell you, some of you, some of us, will even go through depression at Christmas and the holidays because we've got this idea that this is not the perfect picture. This is not what I want. I have to drop my head. I have to be embarrassed because of that. I guarantee you, even in the middle of that, when God was blessing Joseph, going through there and having this pregnant wife on a donkey as they go out, going, oh, there they go. Oh, yeah. People talking and everything else. It wasn't what they planned. But God was still in the middle of it. God is God. And God is with us during the unexpected. God is with us when we face disappointments in our lives. Sometimes God even organizes disappointments in our lives. I don't, I don't think it was an accident that they went through and knocked on and there was no room, no room. I think God orchestrated and filled up all the things and pushed people in there and then said, all right, come on in, guys. The Holy Spirit of God wanted it. He was born to die for our sins. I believe every aspect, like we talked about last week, about he was born into humility. His entire life was humility, and he was born to be the lamb led to the slaughter. He was born in the manger on purpose. Let me tell you, there's going to be disappointment in your life, okay? There's disappointment in your life right now. This is, this is not what I wanted. And, and as they get there and they're thinking, all right, we'll just get there and everything will be on okay. And when it's not, God is still God. And God is still with us. Let me show you the next thing. He is still God. He is God with us as we face opposition in our lives. As the children of God, you have to understand, as the children of God, you are at the same time the enemy of Satan. Child of God, enemy of Satan. How many of you right now, raise your hand, I am a child of God right now. If you have your hand raised, you are an enemy of Satan. Do you get it? As long as you are an enemy of Satan and you are carrying out the work of God, you are going to face opposition. They were carrying the very salvation that the world needed, and they faced opposition. And we sit that and go, why, why, why? And God says, because you're the enemy. Because you represent me. Because you are carrying out the good. It's going to happen in your life. And some of us, we get discouraged and we quit in the very middle of us doing what God wanted us to do. Because we have this idea, well, if God loved me, if God cared, God, God would provide this money, God would take care of this, God would do that. Man, what tragedy came into their lives. Honey, wake up. Honey, wake up. we got to go. They're going to kill our baby. We've got to run. I don't understand. Why would God allow this to happen? That's it. I'm going to read you a verse. I don't want you to listen to this. I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. It makes sense. I'm, I'm telling you, he was born into our brokenness. God was born exactly where he wanted to be. The Bible says, for he, hath, in Isaiah 53, 3, he, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He's not unfamiliar with your hurts. He was born into that mess because he chose to be born into our mess. Now, that doesn't make sense. What would make sense that he was born into a kingdom to rise up and say, I am God and holy and perfect, and then go to the cross to die for our sins to pay for it. But it doesn't make sense that he was born into my problems. But he was. And we hid it as ourselves, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs. That's why he came. That was the heart of Christ. He carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. I, I love that. The manger, the problems, the young couple struggling and fearful and everything else, God said, that's where I want to be. I want to be born smack into the middle of their brokenness. But here's my last point, the second point. Not only was he born into their brokenness, he was born for our brokenness. See, we see this whole God with us thing as we see this 
And I, I, I want to show you because you say, man, this is really naked, uh, uh, negative. The, the way that you're going to pull this in and show that th- that was broken and they were hurting and all this stuff going on. But let me show you the good part of this. Go back to Luke chapter 2. Let, let me show you the unexpected blessing. We can talk about the unexpected problem, but in the middle of that, there was also the unexpected blessings. You realize because God loves you so much, he's going to take care of you. But the problem is you don't understand that he's going to take care of you because you want him to take care of you your way. You have it all worked out. Lord, if I had an extra thousand dollars this week, I would be okay. And God said, well, you'll be okay, but it's not going to be because I give you an extra thousand dollars. No, an extra thousand dollars would be awesome, but... A lot of times we we work out our problems and then we like tell God, this is a good way to fix it. And don't deny that. If, if, if Honey, if, if we get this and then this comes in at this time and if this works out, we're going to be fine. So we pray for this and this and this and God's going, oh, I'm not doing that. I got another plan. Luke chapter 2 verse 15. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go now even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord God hath made known unto us. And you guys know this was like simultaneously. She gives birth, manger, no room, traveled 80 miles, unexpected problems, unexpected disappointments, all the other things that came in there. And she's sitting in there. And you can imagine, Joseph, have we failed God? I mean, he's entrusted us with so much. Maybe you do that same thought. Honey, have we failed God? God has given us these kids and we, we're not doing this and our son has this problem and this. And have we just failed? Are, are we just failures? Is that the problem? Joseph, have we just not done a good enough job? Was our faith not good enough? Were we not persistent enough? Did we not knock on enough doors for the son of God to have to be born and laid in a manger? I, I just don't know if I even measure up. Ever think what it would feel like to be them? In that situation and just saying, Lord, I don't don't know. I just feel that. It's awesome how God comes in and puts his hand of blessing on you. I know this part. I love how God, in our brokenness, in our hurts, in our failures, God reaches through the darkness just to put his hands on our shoulders just to say, no, you're okay. And God does that through one another. And God does that through blessings. And God does that through heartaches that we have that somebody else will love on you or say something or write you that card or whatever just to whisper in your ear through God to say I love you and you're not despised I'm not picking on you it's not that I don't love you you say Pastor Tony you're reading into this okay notice this so the wise the the shepherds come and they bow down and worship him and Mary is sitting back going Joseph what's going on how do they know honey how do they know I thought we were the only, we didn't go advertising how this, no. But the Bible says in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and she pondered them in her heart. Have you ever wondered what that means? All I could imagine, she's sitting there saying, Lord, forgive me for thinking you didn't care. Lord, forgive me. Because out of nowhere, these shepherds come in and just said, we just saw the heavenly host. They were singing and shouting and praising God that the Savior of the world was born. And they told us that we get to be in His presence and we're here today. And they bow down and worship a baby. And all of a sudden, they're stepping back. And Mary and Joseph are just saying, reaching out. I can imagine that. that like couples do, reaching out in the darkness, just holding her hand and saying, God's with us. That was God. Have you ever thought that maybe it has, that had nothing to do with the shepherds? It was everything to do with Mary and Joseph? Maybe, maybe they're, they're sitting there being discouraged and everything, and God said, send them some shepherds. Seriously, send them some shepherds. They, they need to know that I'm in this. They need to know that they're not alone. God will do little things in your life, those unexpected blessings, just to tell you, you are not alone. Yes. Yes. They go into the city, and there's Simeon. And they're just doing the job, and it's the tradition of what they did. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 28, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now let us, thou thy servant depart from thee according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. One more time, Mary standing off to the side, did, she, did he just say salvation? Joseph, I, I wasn't expecting this. I, I, I didn't even know who this man was. And when he asked to hold our baby, I, did, I didn't know what to say. 
which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Two years later, Mary and Joseph, I'd imagine, you guys don't look at it like this, but stop and think about it. Where did they get their money? He's a carpenter. They're traveling. Their world was turned upside down. And I'm sure even in that day and age of what they did of, uh, of hey, honey, there was this man's cart broke down and I was able to fix his cart and I, I was able to put the hinges back on their door and I, I made a couple of shekels here and there, but it's not enough to keep going. And honey, if we don't have money, we're not going to make it. You get a knock at the door. And there's a caravan of magi standing outside the door. Uh, can I help you? We followed his star and it stopped right here. And we just have all these gifts to give you because we've traveled two years to worship your child. Now we look at it and say, flip the page, that's what happened. Just imagine being them. Honey, there's visitors here. What do they have? Riches. I mean, that's what they go, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And all of that was delivered. Not that they went out to seek it. It was delivered to their doorstep. So how did they survive? Because God provided. Yes, there's going to be unexpected problems, even with God with us. But I'll tell you, there's going to be unexpected blessings that God will put into our lives. Amen. I, I just looked at that and thought, wow, God with us. Let me take this story further because I want to make application. Not, not only do we see the unexpected blessings, but we see his unconditional love. His unconditional love. We're talking about being God being born for our brokenness. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, so loved us. And we witnessed his love. And I started thinking, and I, honestly, I got this from our play this year. As I sat in the pew and I, I, I walked through what God did with the different stories and situations. And I take you first to the woman at the well. And you, you see that God's love of, of coming to brokenness. He wasn't just born into the brokenness. He was born for our brokenness. And God began to seek out the broken everywhere that he went. And this woman had been married five times. Do you know why she was the only one at the well that day? Because she went when the other women did not go. She went during the day and they would go during the cool of the morning. She was despised. She was rejected. She had no friends. Nobody went with her. She was not the popular girl in town. She was not favored by the other women. God still sought her out. It doesn't matter. The fact that she'd been married five times or she tried to find love and happiness. It didn't matter that nobody else loved her. God loved her. He was born for our brokenness. I take you to the maniac of Gadara that the people drug him outside the city and they would bind him because there was nothing else they could do. And he was, had a demon about him that he could not control. And it reminds me of how many people in our churches and world that are so bound by, by an addiction of something in their life. And they feel like, I will never, ever overcome this. And the people just push you to the side. But God was born for his brokenness. God went to him. Controlled by demons. I'll take you to that woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Busted. You know, you know why the Bible throws certain things for us to see? Because they threw her down and said she's caught in the very act. You know what that was saying? No excuses. Nothing can get her out of this. There is no way for her to overcome guilty without excuse. But Jesus stepped in. Do you, do you see the theme of everything? He wasn't going to build a kingdom. He was going to the broken because he was born into the brokenness for our brokenness. She was supposed to be a public example set on that day. But instead she had her sins forgiven and sent away to live her life. Can I read it again? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I know this isn't Easter, but I, I, I think of every one of those brokenness. As he came to the woman at the well and the maniac of Gadara and the chains and the emptiness. And he went over to that woman that said that she was caught in the very act and all these different people. I, I, I just pictured in my mind that brokenness that God set her free. But he could not just discard the sin or the weight or the problem 
You cannot just let go of your past. Your past is still there. Do you guys get that? That debt is still there. But that's what makes the gospel so amazing. Because he carried, sure he had born, carried, took up, place upon himself. The woman was able to go away without that sin. But the sin did not go away. It was placed on him. That's what the Bible is saying through this whole thing. Surely he had carried, he had borne upon himself. He carried it to the cross. Every bit of this, every aspect of this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. I know he was born for our brokenness. Because we see the unexpected blessings that came of it. We see the unconditional love that he gave. But I want to close with this. The unexplainable grace. The unexplainable grace. Looking back at the curse. I I want you to see this. Because God gave me this this week. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Talk about. He was born, and for unto us a child is given, unto us this child is born, for unto you go into Bethlehem, is born this child, and we say that born, born, born. He has realized that Christ chose to be born. And you're thinking, well, duh, he didn't have to be born. He could have came as the son of God and left, but he was born to be a baby. He was born to be raised of woman. He was born to be in the world. He was born to be of the brokenness. And then this hit me. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. For the woman, he said, this is after their fall. I will, here's the two, two signs of the curse. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and conception. And in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Verse 17. And unto Adam, he said, verse 18, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Two things that Genesis from the very beginning that brought in the curse, the sorrow and the brokenness into our lives. That there were signs of that much more. Yes, much more. But two that the Bible brings out. Birth and pain and thorns and thistles. And it hit me. God chose to be brought in through one, and he was taken out by the other. He was born in through a woman, through the pain of that curse, and he was brought out through the crown of thorns as a symbol of our curse. You see, that is why he came. In Genesis, he lays out and says, guys, because of your pain and your your sin and your rebellion, this is what's going to come in. And at the end of the story, he was born in through it and taken out through it, symbolizing that God was born for our brokenness in our lives. Stop and think about this. Life is not a silent night. All is not calm. All is not bright. And I'm I'm looking in the faces if I was going to go around the the room right now and say, stand up and testify. A lot of you say, man, I wish this is what I thought, but I'll be honest. I don't know if I'm going to have a job the first of the year. Next person, stand up. I'll be honest, Pastor Tony, I've, I've been slipping. I had a bad year and I haven't been living right. Next person, stand up and say, man, me and my wife are on the verge of divorce and nobody even knows it. Next person, I'm, I'm so heartbreaking over my child and all this. And here the thing is, God, in the midst of all of this, he said, I give you the gift that can conquer all of those things. He understands, he cares, he loves, and he came to us in the middle of those things. That is the heart of Christ. That is the purpose of Christmas. He didn't come. In the middle of perfection. He he was perfection that was born in the middle of our brokenness. I I just don't want to mistell the story. As we sit there, Mary and Joseph and all that. And there was no problems, no conflict. You know, halos and angels singing. Yeah, uh, there was some of those things. But there was also a lot of disappointment and heartache and pain and suffering and everything else. But God was in the middle of it all. 